Good morning, good afternoon, and if you're here in the lower part of the Southern Hemisphere like me, good evening. I'm Paul Taylor, a strategic advisor with MuleSoft, and it's my absolute pleasure to have the opportunity to talk to you at the first Async API conference, for which the Async API community should be commended on putting together in such a short space of time, and of course, making the event both virtual and free. The subject of my talk today is the unhappy path and dealing with bad events. Although I, I guess the subtitle here could have been Things I wish I'd known before implementing event-driven architecture at scale. I should also add the lessons learned here weren't on every project. I'm not sure that would reflect too well on my abilities to design and implement. But I'm more the product of a long and varied career, and hopefully the points I will cover could save you some time and pain in the future. So a word on the content I plan to present. It's really aimed to provide some pointers to meet the business requirements you're trying to meet with your event-based technology stack. First, I'm assuming you do have business requirements, right? I mean, no one in IT would implement technologies because it's new, cool, and shining, would they? But anyway, the serious point I want to make here is to implement asynchronous patterns well takes hard work. If your requirements could be met with REST request response patterns, do that. The unhappy paths are a hell of a lot easier to deal with the synchronous flows when you can send the response back to the consumer than they are for asynchronous, where you have many decisions to make how to handle failures. I should also be clear on what unhappy path and bad events are, mainly because they're the focus of this talk and it would be good to level set. An unhappy path is the flow you take when an unexpected error or failure occurs, i.e. not the normal happy flow. And bad events, well, they're just that. Events that cause problem, either due to their format or content or just bad timing when they were meant to be processed. I guess um, to give you some background on me, I should say I try to take life not too seriously. And in keeping with the immortal lines from Monty Python, worse things happen at sea. So keep that in mind during the following presentation. I want to start by talking about an event, its shape, its size, and its intent. Though before I do, if anyone's watching is in charge of an enterprise economical data model, firstly, you have my sympathy, and second and most importantly, I should point out that all using this presentation on my own, not my employer. So if I upset you with any of my statements about data modeling, I will apologize now. If you haven't come across an enterprise economical data model before, they can be huge beasts and try to capture and define data across all use cases in the enterprise. This means they can sometimes be a little unwieldy to work with, to say the least. And although at a logical level, um, you can see the benefits, trying to directly implement that in full can be an issue. Now, I must admit my bias against large scale enterprise data models stems from working on projects where it was an unbreakable design principle that the canonical data model had to be used for all interactions. Now, trying to get a large data model to play nice with bandwidth limited devices was a major issue, to be honest. And in fact, that unbreakable design principle had to bend, shall we say, just a little. But anyway, that's my thoughts on uh, all that. So drilling down on an event, what should an event to contain to be most useful? Yes, the core is the significant event or state change, but is that it? My point of view on this is, as a good corporate citizen or even netizen, you need to give some thought on the value of the event you are producing and how you can increase the value of it and help others realize that value. Make it too hard to use and the ROI doesn't make sense. You're going to struggle to get traction. Of course, not all events are equal in value and the associated care that you can subsequently give them. The reality is that some events are even disposable. However, the first point I'd like to make, and it may seem obvious, but is make your events specific, not generic. We often try to make things reusable, but going down this generic path means you end up sometimes overcomplicating or having to constantly enrich what you're trying to achieve with additional metadata for the event to be understood, or worse, you end up doing both, overcomplicating and over enriching. So as an example, if a customer updates an address, does an address update event make more sense for you than a generic custom update event? Which of course could include a whole host of different up updates. It could be you know, their 
their uh, telephone number, their email address, their name change. Um, for me, it's, it's the former that is often the best practice where you have that specific event. So once you've decided on the event, you need to think about the event envelope. What additional data does it make sense to include beyond the captured state change? Do you need to include some time dependent data along with that change? Maybe given the context of the change, i.e. the change was set in motion by a condition being met, or was an event generated by a third party? Maybe it required authorization. The auditing and governance team would thank you for that being part of the depend only event stream because it gives them that source of truth. This can also hold true for channel information. Was this via a mobile channel or, or web app maybe? Thinking about what you can enrich uh, an event with, reference data can often be useful. Is there a requirement for each and every subscriber to that event to end up doing the same lookup to obtain some piece of reference data? Um, would it make sense to actually inject that into the event at the time it's produced? Also, you need to think beyond the initial play of that event. Is there a chance that this event may end up going down a happy path? Will the event contain enough information for you to replay that event in the future? You know, is it the right shape to support the future requirements? Now, I'm not, and I mean, I'm not talking about populating the whole enterprise canonical data model in the event. Very few consumers would thank you for that, not to mention the infrastructure network and security teams. Be pragmatic with the event design. I think history has taught us religious wars never turn out well, and the same can be said for event modeling. My advice would be passionate with your point of view. Maintain design principles, but stay pragmatic. Keep in mind those non-functionals when designing the events. You know, governance, auditing, load handling, you know, they all need to be considered as the wider implementation. You know, and as I said, can you handle the unhappy path with that event when it's replayed in the future? Now, it may be that version one of your event definition has to change over time. That's of course okay. It means you have traction. But just as you no doubt do with your REST API designs currently, tread carefully with those breaking changes. Now, I fully expect Async API to help here, as more and more tooling supports it, allowing events to be designed, understood, and consumed in a consistent way. I want to discuss ordering, you know, and even if you don't have a need now, I would expect at some point on your event-driven architecture journey, you're going to come across event ordering and the need to maintain it. Of course, plenty of use cases don't require strict ordering, but it's not difficult to think of those that do. Banking and insurance, and you could say even more importantly, especially in these times, healthcare. They're all obvious use cases that require the strict ordering of events. Ordering of, of course, sounds easy especially when you have an append-only log. But how do you maintain that order down through the consuming network? You may, as example, have systems of record that still run on Big Iron in the back office that will refuse to update unless state changes are received in a certain ordered sequence. Let's take an insurance use case and the events associated with that. You know, you raise a claim, but you can't pay a claim until the claim has been accessed. So these events in the claim process need to be ordered. So what's the issue with ordering? Well, first let's look at the simplest way to maintain order and the pitfalls you may come across. If we have an ordered event stream or associated broker that maintains order for us and we subscribe with a single consumer for all updates, then making sure each event is consumed and processed before moving on to the, the next. In essence, we've created a end-to-end -end single threaded flow for the normal happy path, we can ensure ordering is maintained. Pretty straightforward. But the problem with this approach aren't difficult to see. For a start, scalability. You can only consume events as fast as a single threaded, single consumer can process them. For low volume, that might not be a problem. But what if the new widget service you introduce just goes viral? You may find the producer creates events far quicker than you can process with this architecture. This would give you an ever-growing backlog, and we all know scaling vertically has its limits. So there's only so much you can do with a single consumer. 
Also resilience. Single consumer is a single failure point. So maybe you need to introduce an active passive configuration. Now, hopefully that will help you avoid downtime, but it doesn't increase throughput. So we still have a scalability issue. Second, what happens if you have a problem with certain events? These are the bad events I mentioned earlier. I, let's say there are data issues with them or a downstream platform refuses, refuses to process it due to stale state being stored. What do you do? Store the event stream consumer, page the operations team, wait until someone comes along and fixes the events manually and restarts the consumer. It's actually how it's handled more commonly than you would think. But to be honest, it's usually a less than optimum solution and can lead to a lot of upset stakeholders in a pretty short space of time, especially if you bring the business to a standstill while the issue is sorted. So what are some of the techniques to mitigate against these? Well, if you need more throughput that can be achieved with a single consumer, you of course first need multiple live consumers. Makes sense, right? And an identify to correlate related events. For example, this could be the account ID or policy number. Without that, you may be purely aggregating events. So order doesn't really matter if you're aggregating, obviously. Then you need a way to ensure that those for a single entity are grouped for consumption to ensure the order is maintained end to end. You can do this either on storage by storing into different partitions, which then have dedicated brokers, or use a broker that hides in-flight events based on the same identity. So if you do have those multiple brokers and three updates in an event stream for account number 42, for example, when the first of those is consumed, the other consumers are shielded from knowing the other two updates exist until that first event has completed. Okay, so now we have multiple consumers, so we can get the throughput we need and we've got resilience and still retain ordering. That's all great. But what about when events get stuck? I.e. the system of record for account number 42 is locked and won't accept any updates for that account. Mm. You see the problem. Are we back to stalling consumers and having the business upset with us? Well, this is where it actually gets interesting as far as ordering is concerned. And we need to introduce a dead letter queue, but more on that later when we take a deep dive into DLQs. Okay, so often we need to consider what happened when and why. So turning to event observability. One of the big problems when ending up down the unhappy path is understanding how you got there in the first place. And also, you know, usually you have to reach the understanding pretty quickly, especially where you have a pressing production issue to deal with. It's very frustrating when you have to rely on a manual log gathering process. And then after a lot of effort, trawling through the logs to still only to get an answer hours or days after the issue. I generally refer to you this as log archaeology. It's not fun, it's tedious, and it takes time. And if you're under pressure, it makes it even more uh, enjoyable. Even worse though, is when you don't have the correct logging in place and need to turn up the debug log and then just wait for it to go wrong again. Uh, you generally don't win friends with that. Ideally, you want to have as much visibility as possible. And of course, enterprise logging and visualization platforms are available, such as Elk or Splunk, et cetera. And they can go some way to helping if implemented across each layer in the enterprise. A key point, of course, is you need a correlation ID of some type, either in the payload or header, to tie together events as they flow through the infrastructure. The end-to-end -end observability of events becomes a key weapon in resolving unhappy path or bad event issues. The, quish, the question does get raised as to what does end-to-end -end practically mean? For example, do you have the ability to observe the event producers? Can you observe the consumers that may fall to the system of record? And again, can you observe the system of record? Given that many enterprises have a varied mix and age of technologies, applications and platforms, rarely can you get a complete unified end-to-end -end view. If you can't go end to end, can you at least ensure that the brokers and associated consumers are at least observable, i.e. observe in the middle? That's a lot better than nothing. Also when building out the observability, give some thought to spawned events. That is events caused by other events. 
Do you have a way to link these together? Doing that is incredibly powerful in the end-to-end -end issue hunt. You will find various tracing frameworks have been developed by industry powerhouses such as Facebook and Google. These are very useful in helping you work through your problems. Even if you don't use the actual framework, they can certainly seed ideas. Now, let's talk about a feedback loop. Even in the age of cloud, elastic scaling, and platform size to handle internet load events, applying a break, or as it's commonly known, back pressure via feedback loop, may seem unnecessary, especially with the event-driven architecture. The consumers can just consume at the level they're comfortable with, right? Well, maybe if you have a greenfield site and no legacy, you can implement true decoupling across all platforms, and back pressure then may seem like a legacy thinking. But certainly I've found that in the greenfield sites, there always seems to be a platform or maybe a SaaS product that can't consistently drink from the fire hose. They sometimes creak under the strain, especially when the events are actually being pushed to them by some middleware rather than being directly consumed. Reacting and implementing support for the back pressure pattern is often implemented during the, in the integration platform. So for example, MuleSoft, obviously example on where to do this, um, where you can actually understand the feedback from the consumer or, or, or target system. To use back pressure, you implement a mechanism indicating that the receiver or subscriber is unable or unwilling to continue with the current applied load. This can be done by the downstream system in various ways, depending on the event transport being used. And as an example, um, using HTTP, returning a 503 status code on, on some of the requests, that being service unavailable, is, is often used to push back on incoming requests. Limiting the consumer concurrent threads is a useful way to limit the impact on the system under stress. Or you can also rate limit by throttling the transaction per second count, i.e. how quickly are you pushing those events down to the platform. Keep in mind that, you know, because you've got cloud-based elastic infrastructure, you can usually just keep scaling. You know, that's great. But you won't be thanked for reducing a system of record to a deadlocked mess by spinning up numerous cloud instances. You need to think of the bigger picture and the overall impact of the enterprise. Just moving bottleneck from one location to the other doesn't actually increase your end-to-end -end throughput. Now, uh, a, a topic which always generates debate. You know? Coupling is really a fun architectural issue and tight coupling is the root of all evil, right? How often have you heard that? I bet in that or some kind of variation, it, it's been a lot. But we're talking about event-driven architecture. So what does tight coupling even mean with an architecture by design that's meant to be decoupled? Well, for me, in the end-to-end -end architecture, you can actually meet many things. It could mean consumers bound to a large set of event attributes, making changes and versioning of your events difficult. Or maybe you've got some kind of complex orchestration of events with hard dependencies between them, i.e. event one has to finish and it has some relationship with event two and you could end up in some kind of infinite loop. You know, that's all kind of hard dependencies you want to avoid. But the one I want to talk to you about now is the coupling of system availability. Most of us expect services to be available when we want them at our convenience, not the convenience of others or the companies we deal with. I know from experience, a surprising number of people want to pay their bills or check balances at 3 a.m. in the morning. Don't ask me why, I just know they do. Giving the customer what they want means system availability needs to be 24 by seven. And if you don't offer that, your competitors will. But the reality is many established enterprises still run back off of systems that need regular maintenance windows. Well, for real-time query operations, you can of course fall back to reduce functionality or use cache data and provide that back to the client while the system of record has downtime. And using a pattern like CQRS, that is command query response resegregation, can help here by having clear paths to handle both the read and the write. Using events, of course, we can decouple those right operations or state changes and then wait till the system record is available before having them consumed. A note of caution here, you need to make sure that it's clearly communicated that this pattern is implemented and try to ensure that client applications don't make assumptions on when state changes will be available. 
So this may mean moving towards a mindset of eventual consistency rather than distributed transaction type of implementation, which traditional enterprises may be more familiar with. You also need to understand how long any schedule actually window is going to be. You don't want to end up with a backlog of events that you're then going to struggle to clear when normal service has been resumed. Right, I'm now going to bring us back to the topic of ordering, one of my favorites. And this time in relation to a dead letter queue. I, I should point out when talking about a dead letter queue or DLQ as I refer to it, it's not available with all technologies, at least out of the box, but although conceptually you can normally implement something similar. We'll just go with the generic definition for here to, to make a point. Generally, the dead letter queue, if you haven't come across one before, can be used by a broker or consumer to store events that can't be exposed, sorry, can't be processed, for example, due to a data error, event envelope, or maybe it's a plain old business logic error. There's usually a retriable parameter that you can set to control the number of attempts that it will try to process that event before it's moved to the DLQ. And, and that's done so that you can handle transition, tran, transient type errors. So for example, a system of record, maybe, uh, maybe you have a HTTP timeout, but next time around it works. You don't want to necessarily fail those events straight away. So when you do hit an error though, it will move the event to the DLQ. And that can unblock a bottleneck and allow later events to be picked up for processing. But when you're trying to process events in order, it, it now, of course, gives us an ordering problem. We take our example from earlier, but now use DLQ. Let's assume we have a problem with event one for account 42. We can move that event to the dead letter queue. But what do we do now with events two and three for that same account? Without thought on our part, the default behavior is usually events two and three are ready to be consumed as soon as event one is moved. And we then propagate out of order events across the enterprise. You know, exactly what we were trying to avoid. Now, given that most, if not all DLQs are actually a generic queue or partition that has just been designated to be a DLQ, it actually works exactly the same as the original event store as regards ordering. So how do we handle this? Well, one way is to have the consumer check if any pending failures exist for the event identity, i.e. does account 42 have an event in the DLQ? Now, if this isn't possible, if it isn't possible for you to directly query against the DLQ data store, for example, your DLQ might not support a search type operation, you may need to maintain an external operational database that can be used to track failures, uh, you know, updated each time you have a failure and removed when it's completed. Um, and that will give you an idea if there are any pending failures that exist. If there are, you know, what do we need to do? We need to move the subsequent events and quarantine them, you know, just like us, place uh, event two and three into quarantine in the DLQ to ensure they're not processed out of order. You may have some uh, corrective maintenance done. Someone may have to come and look at the events, figure out what they're gonna do, move them back once they've been fixed, or, you know, maybe delete them if that's the appropriate course of action. It's not pretty, but it helps automate as much as possible the failing events. And of course, it's really preferable to only have to deal with one affected customer rather than have all customers being blocked. A tip, of course, is to some, have some kind of alerting set up for the DLQ. Monitor its depth. It can be a good early warning sign of problems and good to give the relevant stakeholders a heads up of any potential problems. One of the characteristics of high levels of automation is when things go wrong, they can go wrong at tremendous speed. Before you know it, you can have a big steaming pile of issues to resolve. Catching these early can be a challenge, especially if the failure is subtle. One example of this I came across was when a downstream process to send out communications to customers, emails in fact, had a failure in send. The problem was it interpreted the send failure as a bounce back and had been configured to mark the customer email address as invalid. And in such a case, it started to update all of the customer records to reflect this. And I'm talking about millions of customer records. The first sign that we had that something was wrong was the number of events 
causing right backs to the system and record went through the roof. In fact, the operations team remarked in passing how well the cloud infrastructure was holding up under the load. So here we have a valid producer creating conformant events, but just making incorrect assumptions. Now, given this scenario, catching these type of issues can be difficult. They could be viewed as edge cases and each type of failure like this may be different, so difficult to code in advance. The best way I have come up to handle this issue, but if you've already solved it in a better way, please let me know, I'd be interested to hear, was monitoring of the event load. If a sudden large increase of usually fairly predictable events were seen, it would trip a safety valve, install the consumer until someone could come and eyeball the actual events, see what was going on, make a reasons decision on whether they should restart that and carry on. Of course, in the meantime, all events would be installed, but they were just not being propagated on. Actually, to, to fix the impact of this, this email issue I mentioned, we had to do a mass replay once we figured out what the problem was, but this time flipping the email invalid flag back to its correct value. Otherwise, no one would have got emails, which you may think was a good thing, but the company in question certainly didn't. What I found was funny though, was how something like this shows the value of event-driven architecture to a wider audience. Without being able to replay, each system of record incorrectly had update, would have had to done a restore. Even from backups or go and write jobs that sweep the database and make updates, needing to figure out the logic to tease out which had been invalid updates and which had actually been correctly uh, updated previously in the past. It, it would have been a mess and it would have taken a long time to sort out. Because in this case and in general, the systems of record, which there were many of them, relied on traditional related databases as a store of truth. So they only stored the latest update. They didn't have a history of updates. So a point to keep in mind, depending on what you're trying to resolve, is you might not be able to do a straight replay. Though if you can get away with that, it's usually straightforward as you can set the consumer back to the event you wish to start from and then just let it roll forward. If that doesn't fly for you, you may have to do some data transformation on the fly, just as we did. So fun times and not much sleep that night, but the business was up and running next day and I'm pretty sure complaining about something else. It's you know pretty surprising how soon people forget. Okay, that's my story. But I wanted to wrap up with a few points. First, let me be clear. The point of my talk wasn't don't do events or event-driven architecture or don't use async API. I'm a big fan. It's more look out for the issues we've just reviewed and if you come across them, then hopefully will this help you navigate them and do events well. If not the first time, maybe at least with version two of your implementation. I have found that within reason, mem memories fade on how long it took to deliver something, but production issues, they're more of a constant headache. So do all you can to avoid those. Remember, you know, as much as I like events, events aren't a cure-all. They're just another tool in your toolbox. Don't get tempted to use them for every use case. Does a request response implementation also make sense? These things need to be considered. Help yourself by helping others. Use async API to convey the details intent of the events you're dealing with. This lowers both the barrier to entry, speeds development, and helps with the event self-serve, i.e. teach them to fish. Try to design failure handling into your environment early in the process. It's much easier to think about the best way to handle those at the design stage, not at 2 a.m. when you're trying to get a very upset stakeholder back online. And of course, in a world where toilet paper seems to take on special value when we're dealing with a virus that is far as I know, affects breathing and temperature, but I'm not a doctor, I guess you need to always expect the unexpected. Well, I hope you enjoyed my talk and found something of interest that may help you in the future. Beyond the Q&A today, if you'd like to discuss further or just connect, you can find me on LinkedIn. I hope you enjoy the rest of the talk schedule today. I know I'm looking forward to them and I hope to speak to you again, maybe even as part of the Async API community. So thank you. And thank you to the Async API community for bringing this day together. Goodbye.